we get up here, and Eddie's like, oh, we got to go visit someone. And so I go, oh, okay. So we take the driver, and we go visit a woman in an old folks' home. She's 96 years old. A woman, Rosanna DeSoto's mother. Beautiful woman. Yeah. Eddie sat with her and talked with her for such the longest time. And it brought me back to being a child. And when I listened to my family talk, and that's the man he is. You know, I'm going off a little off script. You all know he did Stand and Deliver. We love that. He was on Broadway, Zoot Soup, we know that. Miami Vice, Battlestar Galactic. I can go on and on on all his credits. But I have to tell you, the credit I love the most is when I see him with people and how much he loves and cares for Latinos and this country. He loves it. But after that, we go to another event. And he, oh, we have to go to another event, Rick. Okay, all right, we're in the car, go to another event. A group of teachers, chancellors. He goes to their home. They give us tacos, which is cool. I hadn't had tacos in a while, so I liked it. And we talked. And after that, we still met more people. He has always reached out to people in that time and talked to them. And that's why I'm so proud to have Eddie James Olmos on the show. And now I'm going to show you a little reel of his work. Take a look. Started baseball, and 
I was five years old when I started playing ball, and I started to play it um, seven days a week, and uh, never missed a day. And I got to not from not knowing anything about baseball to by the time I was 10, 11, 12. By 12, I was the California State Batting Champion here in California, and uh, playing with the uh, Dodgers Farm single A ball. Bobby Knopf and Gary Knopf, the Knopf brothers, and George Penn, and a whole bunch of great athletes. And I was 13, 14 years old. Catching Eddie Roebuck, Sandy Koufax, in the Winter League. And I was a little kid. But what surprised me was that I went from not knowing anything to playing this game really well. And everybody thought I was going to be a ball player. I did to a time when I was doing it. But then I heard rock and roll music in about 1957, 58. And uh, I was listening to KFWB, K and about 56, 57 is when it started. It went from, uh, you know, uh, love and marriage, love and marriage, <laughs> that kind of music, to, uh, you know, Little Richard, yeah. Buddy Holly, uh, Richie Balance, uh -huh. and uh, the rock and roll hit. And so I got into music. At 14, I started to sing like I played baseball seven days a week. And I started to play and sing, and pretty soon I had a little garage band that went into playing on the Sunset Strip. And we started playing at uh, Pandora's Box. Whiskey Go Go? And Whiskey, Galaxy, Gazaris. We stayed at Gazaris for four years, seven days a week for four years. Put myself through high school and college playing that. And in that process, I thought I was going to be in music. And then I, I went I entered into college, and when I entered into college, East LA Community College, um, which cost me six dollars a semester. <laughs> six dollars? I, I got my associate budget for 24 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so we used to have nearly free education. That was yes, a good thing. We did. Yeah. Radical well, idea. Yeah. This is back in 1964. And then, you know, in 1966, I graduated from East L.A. and I went to Cal State L.A. and paid $60 a semester. For under $300, I got my bachelor's degree. And that's, that's fair. That's a state yeah. university. Right. It's very fair. And uh, now it's out of whack. It's totally out of whack. I mean, the, one of the problems was that, you know, with, what happened was big business kind of got an education. And all of a sudden, the student loans got more and more. And then all of a sudden, they put in programs that basically said if you defaulted, you, you weren't defaulted. Right? All those things started happening. Do you think we should have go back to that free college education? Why not? Well, I think so, yeah. I really believe that state universities should be free. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, coming out of, you know, going into, from music to acting was uh, thrust by way of going into theater in East L.A. Community College. And then my music, uh, my dancing, singing, acting. In 1978, uh, I pulled it all together. I did El Pachuco and Tutsu, and the world changed. That single piece done by Luis Valdez changed the course of our understanding of our art form of storytelling in this country. Nothing affected more the world. It was a world event because it came from all over the world. People, uh, five different families, Kabuki families from Japan flew in to see it. The entire uh, Royal Shakespearean company, including the executive uh, director of the company, came to see it. Uh, the Moscow Theater took two different plane loads to come to see it. Kahali Indian uh, Theater came to see it. Everybody came from all over the world to watch this one piece of work. And it was a piece of work that changed the course of, of American theater. It was the first American piece of American theater ever done in the United States of America, dealing with Latino themes that hit the great white way. And it was very, very important. But that all was a process. And uh, God almighty, getting into film after doing uh, Zoot Suit, it was all over. I had total creative control of my characters from that moment on and to this day. That's the reason why I've been able to create the things that I've been able to create. Because I have creative control of my characters. Yeah. And that's a big difference. Most artists don't get that 
kind of uh, uh, ability. You, you've been very selective in your role. I mean, from the very beginning. From the very beginning. I mean, you you almost made a point to choose roles like uh, the Ballad of Victoria Cortez, you know, the historical role uh, of Pachuco. All these roles, I think, have, have moved the Latino diet in a positive direction. So that's been amazing. Do you think Hollywood and what they're doing right now is serving us in any way? Do you see it getting any better? They're not serving anybody. <laughs> they don't serve anybody. They just really are looking for the financial uh, profits yeah. of the industry. It's show business, not show sociology. <laughs> <laughs> and so that being said, I took it. Uh, I, did, I never thought I would get to this space of time in, in, in my lifetime. Uh, before Zoot Suit, I was just really just trying to understand myself inside of the art form. Again, working seven days a week. Something very important, you have to really realize this. You're looking at someone that is not naturally gifted, not naturally talented at all. What you're looking at is a person who disciplined themselves to do the things they love to do when he didn't feel like doing it. And that was it. That was it. And that's my big secret. Two secrets. That one and the fact the more you give, the more you receive. And I started when I was 19 years old, I was doing a piece of theater, and um, it was off, 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 off L.A. theater, <laughs> which is really far off Broadway. <laughs> and in the theater, there was no one. We were performing that night, there was not one person in there. But all of a sudden, the show ended, and two people were all the way in the back, up on top, and there were just two young women. <coughs> And they came down after the show was over, and they come up to me and says, uh, can you come to my class? I, I teach at Roosevelt High School and speak to my kids. I was so awkward. I, I said, well, what are you talking about? I have a small role in this play. Nobody comes to see it. You sit up there and you want me to come and speak to your class. About what? <laughs> they go, you know, go find someone that's successful. And I said, they, she said, no, no, no. I need someone that has that's in the struggle. I don't want somebody that's made it. I want somebody that's going through it. And I said, oh, boy, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it before, success <laughs> story. Yes. So they needed that, and they did. They needed to know how and why and who and everything there is to know about people going through this life. So sharing your stories is everything. You share it with your children, you share your stories with your friends, you share your stories with people, and that's how we learn. Yeah. I mean, when before there was, you know, goat singers were people who, who literally, when they were tending the goats up and there was no radio, no nothing, no, there was nothing, they were living in caves, they would tell stories to pass on wisdom, to pass on understanding, to entertain. Yeah. So storytelling has been the epitome of understanding. When I want to captivate an audience, I walk out here and I say to you, let me tell you a story. Everybody, bing! Okay, he's going to tell a story. And they start to listen. If you want to grab an audience, that's the first thing you say. Let me tell you a story. And then you got it. And so we, I turned, I've changed my life because I chose to tell stories about my culture. That was it. I just started telling my own story. And, and lo and behold, I remember a lot of my artist friends who were, you know, very successful said, no, I'm not a, a Latino or Hispanic actor. Take the hyphen away. No one comes up to Dustin Hoffman and says, that great Jewish American actor, Dustin Hoffman. No one comes up to me, that great Italian American actor, Al Pacino. Never. But they do come up and say, the great Latino actor, Edward James Olmos. <laughs> and they do that. And, and, and uh, Andy Garcia, all these, and Jimmy Smith, none of them really wanted that hyphen. None of them. They just wanted to become an actor, period. That's, that's Anthony what Quinn was yeah. an actor, period. Rita Moreno was an actress, period. They never got that tag. But here we come along in the late 50s, late 60s, late 60s really, yeah. and boom, they start tagging us. And they're saying no, and I'm saying I'm fine with it. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, 
I'm a thousand percent Latino.